Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you about the New York Log House, one of the hidden treasures of the city of Pittsburgh, the collected uh, but there's hope, sort of dim hope, but there is some hope for it. It's in really bad shape. Um, termites, rodents inside, water damage, um, everything you can think of that has happened to a wood structure, this has happened. Everything except the fire so far. So I'm going to tell you about um, uh, some uh, some things about the new log house that I hope will find. So, what, what, yeah. Here it is. Yeah. second oldest structure remaining in the city of Pittsburgh. It was built in 1769 by Ambrose Newton. The um, <clears throat> signs outside say 1787, and the literature about the log house, uh, most of that say 17, circa 1767 for a construction date. But 1787 is actually <clears throat> the uh, date of the first deed to the property. The house was built before that by Ambrose Newton in 1769. The only structure that would be older than this in the city would be the block house in Point Park in 1764. Uh, this is the second old and the oldest building built as a, as a residence. Uh, it is an original site, it has not been moved from any other, any other locations. And it is owned by the city of Pittsburgh, part of Sherman Park, uh, neglected, there is no budget for the house uh, uh, at all. The city spends no money on it, uh, volunteers take care of it, uh, but uh, what we're doing mostly is pulling weeds, um, and then in uh, June we, we, we prepare for visitors during the Village Grand Prix when there are a lot of people around the park and we get a lot of visitors. Last year we had 864, I believe, in two days uh, on the Friday, and, on the Saturday and Sunday of the, of the uh, Vintage Grand Prix. We've had as high as 1,300 and something on uh, really good days uh, going through this house in two days. Um, this house, uh, was designated a historic landmark by the city in 1977. And uh, it means nothing to the city, of course. It means nothing to, to take care of the house. Uh, termites, uh, if you go inside, uh, you'll see termites, uh, signs of termites uh, trailing down the logs. Um, the door jam uh, on this door uh, is blown away. Um, this picture was taken about uh, five or six years ago, and uh, you don't see as many curled and missing shingles as you would go as you would see if you go there now. Uh, the flashing that you see around the chimney has been blown off by windstorms. Uh, it was, I think, uh, about uh, five years ago. I think uh, there are uh, there's a maze of animal tunnels all around the property and the roads are underneath the house. There's uh, rabbits and uh, uh, some uh, big creature like a mole that moves faster than uh, I think a mole moves. A lot of the others I haven't been able to uh, look at it close at that. And there are chipmunks underneath. Um, water spots everywhere inside. Uh, when it rains hard, if you go inside, you'll see water running down the chimney inside like Niagara Falls. Uh, water 
uh, or the chicken has been blown away at the chimney uh, more than it is in that, in that picture. But, but if you look at it now, you'll see that the chicken has been blown away by acid rain, uh, maybe as much as two inches from the surface of the, the outer surface on the stones, which allows water to seep inside the chimney, water going down inside the chimney uh, uh, into the interior of the house. Uh, fortunately, there are uh, slight cracks between the floorboards, and water will run down the chimney, cross the hearth, and down between the uh, cracks and, and the logs in the floor, and uh, down below the crawl space. It, it doesn't do any harm. We move the furniture away from the fireplace when we're not uh, showing the house, and so there's no damage. There is uh, water damage to the uh, floor beams, beams on the floor, in the, in the back corner of the house. Uh, you can see some of the floorboards, actually they're not floorboards, they're puncheons on the first floor, they're half round logs, they're very sturdy, uh, it's a very sturdy floor. Half round logs, not boards on the, uh, the ground level. But uh, some of those puncheons, uh, uh, in fact, in the back corner, have sunk down about <coughs> two inches because of the beams that are rotted underneath. And I can go on and on. Uh, but uh, there is, there has been no repairs on this house since 1990. Uh, uh, a, uh, the Pittsburgh Park Conservancy is in charge of renewing, restoring uh, the, the four major parks and it is not on their list of things to do this year. And whether it's going to be next year, I don't know. Uh, I uh, sent an email to Meg Cheever uh, in, uh, a couple months ago, um, and pleading with her to repair the house. And she said, it's on the list, but she didn't say what list. And uh, along with uh, the, the chapel in Rivers, Riverview Park, uh, and this two structures that are most in need of repairs, uh, they are probably not going to be repaired this year. So I just need to think what another butcher might do uh, to this house. Uh, here's a view of the, the back uh, end and the west side of the house. Um, this house was built by Ambrose Newton uh, in 1769. He was a soldier for the British Army at Fort Pitt. The executor of his estate described him as a uh, keeper of the king's stores, which I guess is a uh, quartermaster. In 1769, he uh, started the procedure of buying property in Pennsylvania, uh, which was uh, first step would be getting uh, the uh, getting a survey of the land that the person wanted. He had surveyed 262 acres uh, in the entire, almost the entire northern 60% of Shimmer Park. Here's a copy of that survey. And you know, I don't have a laser. Well, anyway, the diagonal line at the top. Uh, the northern boundary of his, of his uh, property, that is through and the Thumbelman Streets. The line over on the right, uh, Darlington Road, and the uh, sort of zigzag line on the right, uh, on, on the left, I mean, that is Junction Hollow. And then this zigzag line down at the south end here, that is, uh, would be a line somewhere south of Panther Hollow Drive. That is 262 acres, about 60% of Shumley Park. Ambrose Newton uh, moved onto this property in 1769. Built house. This is not Ambrose Newton, this is not the New York House. This is a copy of a lithograph from the 18th century uh, depicting how people. Uh, uh, built log houses. This is a house warming, or house raising, and all the neighbors came by to help uh, the family build their house. 
and there's probably a barn or, or something else being built over here, or maybe this uh, structure on the right is, is the shed, and then maybe that the other structure would be a house. That's all from that. There's no caption to this uh, illustration. Uh, maybe uh, in the wintertime, a couple of months later, Ambrose Newton might have had something like this. The property has been cleared of most of the trees. Uh, there are uh, cattle and goats or sheep over on the lower right hand corner. Uh, way in the back, in front of the house, there's a woman standing and there's some pigs uh, rooting around in the uh, yard in front of her. And there's a man cutting a log uh, in the center foreground. So, um, if Ambrose didn't have a house like that before he um, he was ready. Uh, we don't know if he did that much. We think that Ambrose Newton was a bachelor because uh, if you go in the Neil Log House uh, and you'll see two fireplaces, it's very rare to have two side-by-side -side fireplaces in a log house. I'll have a picture of this later. Um, uh, the, there's a larger fireplace for, for cooking and a smaller one on the side for heating at night. If he had children, he, if he and his wife had children, or uh, uh, they would, the children would sleep upstairs, and that second fireplace would be upstairs in the loft. Um, the, uh, the beams going across uh, where, the, where the roof meets the walls, that would be uh, boarded over, and then there would be a ladder going up to the loft. Uh, infant children would sleep with the parents downstairs, and older children would be upstairs. Um, it's because of the two side-by-side -side fireplace on the lower floor, uh, probably Ambrose Newton was a bachelor, or he and his wife were childless. And maybe he didn't go any farther than this. Uh, he may not have any barns, no sheds, uh, um, uh, just you know, no fencing, you know, say a vegetable garden. Uh, no, no, it's speculation. Um, Ambrose Newton did not pay for his property. He was a squatter. Most people in rural frontier Pennsylvania in those, in those days were squatters. There was no government in Western Pennsylvania to enforce the laws. So people came west uh, from the crowded uh, east coast, picked up uh, some property they liked, and just settled there without paying the Penn family uh, any money for the property. Actually, the Penn family, and later uh, under the Commonwealth after the Revolution, when, this, when the Commonwealth confiscated the, the Penn family's properties, uh, they, both the Penn family and, and the Commonwealth, condoned squatting because it encouraged people to move west and colonize the unpopulated frontier. And there were issues with Virginia at the time. Uh, the, the state with the most population would uh, win any fights and any battles. So they encouraged uh, uh, you know, squatting, and they would settle up later when, when there's a sheriff out there in the 17, the 1780s, and the sheriff would uh, come around and make you pay your uh, uh, pay for your property. So. <coughs> Ambrose Newton died in 1773. In 1774, James Wilson, a very prominent um, lawyer from Lancaster, later to be um, a very big in the revolutionary movement, and uh, not at first, but he was later, uh, and also to be a, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. James Wilson sold Ambrose, New Ambrose Newton's house and the contents at a public sale in Hannestown in 1774. It was very common then for property, uh, for, for the improvements of property to be sold, bought and sold, even though a squatter didn't own the land. He would sell the improvements to land, any house, uh, fencing, sheds, barns, uh, would be bought and sold. Um, he would, it would, charge uh, some extra price to a settler 
uh, coming the, 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 the uh, next settler coming to his, to his squatter's property would be charged for plowed land. Uh, maybe if they planted uh, an orchard, they would be charged for that. That was very common. So James Wilson in 1774 sold the house contents and whatever improvements um, there was on the property to Robert Hanna. Uh, was Wilson an elected official or something? Or he wasn't an attorney at the time. Was he appointed by the king or England or something like that? Or? No, he was a, a private attorney. He was a, the executor of the estate. Uh, uh, I heard his estate. Okay. And uh, so um, he sold the uh, <clears throat> he sold the uh, house and contents and, and any improvements to Robert Hanna, uh, judge of Westmoreland County, founder of Hanna's Town, which was a county seat at the time, uh, for, uh, sold the property to, uh, for 60, um, I think 63 pounds, nine shillings. I forgot the price. It's in the brochure uh, you have there. Uh, two days later, Robert Hanna sold the same thing back to James Wilson for the same amount of money. Uh, those two transactions happened, I think, because James Wilson had somebody lined up already to buy the property. But as the executive of the estate, he couldn't profit from the sale of the estate. So he sold it to um, another person discharges duties as uh, executor, bought the stuff back, sold it to, I think, Robert Neal of Marduk Township of Lancaster County. Marduk Township is about five miles uh, south of Lancaster uh, on the Columbia, uh, on, on the um, Susquehanna River, very close to the uh, borough of Columbia. Uh, there are some other Robert uh, Neals uh, in the census records and in the genealogical records uh, in Pennsylvania at the time, but the only one who uh, would, the uh, likely one, or the most likely one, uh, when you consider age and location, would be this, Mark, this Robert Neal uh, of Martic Township. So I think Robert Neal came to the Shelley Park property in 1774. He already had, uh, he already had uh, this house that Robert Neal built. This uh, monument, by the way, at the bottom of the step, Cabotac Castle Monument, has nothing to do with uh, uh, Robert Neal or anybody uh, known to have occupied uh, the house. Uh, the city, when this um, uh, monument was installed uh, in 19, uh, uh, early 19, Arts, I think, uh, just wanted a place to um, put a nice monument to honor the Indians. And then I'll have a picture of what this looked like before this monument was placed there. Uh, Robert uh, Neal had a house uh, to come to, the one that uh, Ambrose Newton built. So he had a much easier time of it. Uh, he may have. Uh, well, this is, uh, I should say that Robert Neal and his family are typical uh, of the uh, people who were involved in the Western movement of uh, American history. One of the most important themes of American history is uh, inexorable movement westward uh, from the east to the uh, open west, looking for a better life for themselves, for their children, uh, looking for cheap land. Uh, this family uh, might have had uh, Rucker cobbled along and pigs and nuts shown in this uh, in this lithograph. Um, it was very common for them for the sellers to bring their entire possessions with them. All their animals, uh, vegetable seeds and everything. Uh, they may have uh, Niels may uh, may have uh, done something like this since they were a long time occupants of the property. There's a fence uh, around the house, and most importantly, I love the vegetable garden, so the chickens and the animals won't get out the vegetables. Uh, over in the uh, bottom 
the uh, middle uh, left are our uh, horses. Uh, and there's, there's a cow lying down in the center. Uh, in, uh, against the uh, fence, there's a suckling, uh, there's a sow suckling for piglets. Over a little bit to the farther to the left, there may be some chickens or something you know, which you can't make out. Uh, there is a woman uh, holding an infant in front of the door. In the back, you can see the land is cleared. Crops are being tended to by men, uh, perhaps uh, teenage sons. And uh, so uh, the Neils may have done something like that within a couple of years of their arrival uh, uh, in the Shelly Park property. They would have uh, probably grown uh, wheat and corn, rye. Uh, there's even tobacco was grown here uh, as a cash crop or, or, for, or to trade. Rye would have been made into whiskey uh, as a cash crop or for trading. Uh, they would have grown all their vegetables. Um, gathered um, uh, berries, uh, they would have uh, hunted. Um, like, uh, oh, and um, here is a woman uh, spinning thread, women's work. Uh, gender uh, things were very well defined in those days. Uh, here's a hunter. And uh, if uh, the family couldn't get downtown to where Fort Pitt is, uh, in the stores around there, here's an itinerant uh, uh, salesman uh, going around the country uh, trading or selling uh, things that the family needed. There was no money then, though, so, the, so uh, there, uh, I mean, there was little, very little money in Western Pennsylvania, so the family probably traded uh, goods rather than uh, spent money. In, uh, the article that uh, was on the table in the back, the 1915 article, uh, the, the reporter probably uh, interviewed an Elizabeth Birchfield, who was uh, the great-great-granddaughter of Robert Neal. Uh, she was alive at the time the uh, article was written. She lived at Beechwood and Birchfield, Beechwood Boulevard and Birchfield uh, Street. She married into, uh, the Birchfields married into the Joseph Horn Company. Uh, and they were, Birchfields were uh, prominent in the operation of horns for uh, many years, well into this, into the uh, uh, 20th century. But she was probably the one interviewed about uh, uh, a story that's in this article that's on the back table, uh, uh, saying that uh, Robert Neal earned extra money by be, being a Conestoga wagon driver, carrying freight and passengers um, between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Uh, and, uh, and because he, was, he did that, he could, uh, he had extra money, could buy nice things, and he could have, uh, he could speculate in uh, land, as many people did in those days. The only thing wrong with the story is that um, the roads over the mountains uh, were very bad and uh, narrow uh, and could not accommodate big Conestoga wagons like this. Uh, so maybe, maybe uh, Robert Neal uh, led pack horses across the mountain. Uh, these are pack horses. The one in front may be carrying whiskey uh, for sale. The back east, Monongahela whiskey was uh, highly prized. Uh, it was considered uh, uh, the best kind of rye whiskey to be had. Uh, at any rate, Robert Neal and his family did have some money, however they bought it. They did uh, buy property downtown uh, on the east side of Market Square, um, where Pendle's Market used to be. Uh, the, there's a fast, couple of fast food restaurants there now. The property extends all the way over to 4th Avenue to where Burke's building is, where the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy has its, uh, or had, or moving, they had its offices uh, there. The Robert Neal sold the half of the property that faced uh, Forbes Avenue almost immediately to a woman, uh, and the other half. Um, was still owned by Neil in uh, 1795, 
but it was taken at the time. Uh, he also was probably the Robert Neal who uh, began the, um, uh, the procedure of, of uh, purchasing property in Westmoreland County about uh, a mile or two west of Seven Springs in Somerset County. Uh, there's still a, um, a creek called Neal's Run going through that property. Uh, the, um, oh, I should say that um, the Neals came to um, Pittsburgh with, probably with three daughters. And they had two daughters uh, later. Uh, so uh, according to uh, uh, the best uh, uh, estimates, uh, according to the census records, there were uh, six people living in the house at that time, mother and father and four daughters in that uh, small house, uh, in that uh, essentially one room and loft, uh, very cozy. Uh, three uh, uh, occupants later, the, the uh, property changed and three times after the meals left. Well, let me talk about the meals uh, some more. Uh, Try to get to the picture of the Neal Law House again. There. Um, the Neals uh, Oh, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. Well, let me go back on to uh, James and Harold. Three uh, orders after Robert Neal was James O'Farrell. Probably the richest man uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, revolutionary war uh, uh, soldier, uh, manufacturer of all sorts, uh, and brought in uh, salt uh, from uh, um, uh, um, Salzburg uh, area, uh, was sort of early, one of the earliest glass factories. Uh, uh, had a boat factory. Uh, wheeler dealer in uh, real estate. Um, this granddaughter was Mary Chinley. Her mother also um, was very wealthy. Mary O'Hara uh, inherited money through George Kahn. Uh, Mary Chinley's uh, name is Mary Kahn Chinley. Uh, I'm sorry, Mary Kron uh, her, uh, is her mother's side. James O'Hara is the father's side. She ordered, she uh, inherited money from both uh, sides of the family. They were both very large uh, real estate speculators. Mary Shinley owned uh, a good bit of Pittsburgh. Almost everything between the two rivers, the Allegheny and uh, the lawn was from Springfield, Lawrenceville, Oakland, not along the Mary Shumley. Uh Property downtown, uh, Harrow Township, um, property in Indiana, uh, hers. She was very wealthy. She uh, donated the land uh, for Shumley Park. The uh, city, Edward Bigelow, the, um, the uh, head of of uh, public works at the time um, had his eye on Shumley Park as uh, for a park. It was uh, never subdivided by Mary Shinley. Squirrel Hill and Oakland was subdivided. The, the, uh, her property was never subdivided. So you have this vast green space of um, perhaps uh, four or five hundred acres that Mary Shinley Sh Sh owned. I'm uh, not subdivided. Edward Bigelow wanted that property for a park. In 1889, uh, Edward Bigelow found out that a developer was going to England, where Mary Shinley lived, to convince her to sell Shinley Park, or what is now Shinley Park, uh, to him so he could subdivide it. Uh, Edward Bigelow sent Mary Shinley's 
uh, attorney, Robert Carnahan, to England to convince Mary Shelley to donate the property. Uh, the story is that uh, Robert Carnahan and this uh, developer were on the same boat going over to uh, England. The, uh, uh, the, um, when the boat uh, stopped in Ireland, in Cork, Ireland, uh, the uh, developer stayed on the ship, traveled on to London uh, on that ship, but Carnahan, Mary Shirley's attorney, uh, got off the boat, took a fast train to London, and got to Mary Shirley, convinced her to donate the property, and, uh, and the story is that as he is leaving Mary Shirley's mansion, uh, the developer is coming up the wall. <laughs> so, uh, the park uh, is established in 1889. Uh, here is uh, uh, a rustic bridge. They're all gone now. It was developed according to the um, uh, philosophy of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. Beautiful vistas. Uh, here's a, the Westing House Pond, it was the first festival pond uh, before uh, the monument to Westing House was placed there. This is uh, the road on the um, on the right is Circuit Drive. You can see uh, going up the hill on the right is the, is the path to the Beale Log House. On the left is the Serpentine Drive going down the hill. This is the Neil Log House when Mary Shinley owned it. She rented it out to uh, um, as either a permanent residence or as a summer uh, picnic uh, spot. This is probably a permanent residence of a family having um, uh, a 4th of July uh, uh, picnic. There's bunting on the kids' hats in the the doorway. Uh, over on the left are tripods, which you can hardly see in this uh, picture. Uh, that where they're cooking. Uh, and then they're cooking inside with a smoking on the chimney. And it looks much as it does now, except for those two poplar trees on either side, and then there are uh, plattered uh, 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 boards on the roof rather than shingles, which was more, much more likely to be used originally. This is a picture of a house after the park was established. This uh, uh, rock, the stone line uh, indentation is a fountain. And uh, that is a cock, uh, probably who just uh, given his horse a drink of water there. Uh, and then uh, about uh, sometime after 1900, 1910, uh, that uh, was what is there now is replaced by that uh, granite monument to Calica Castle. And this is a picture of a house uh, in the 1930s. Uh, the house is that is, a, is on the right and center, on the left and center, and on the on the right is a uh, maintenance shed, public golf course, which is already installed. Uh, that was bigger than the house itself. And there's a front of the house, uh, also in about the 1930s, weeds all over, and the shingles in bad shape. Here is the interior, the fireplace. This is 1930s. This is um, about 1964. Uh, this is when uh, Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation got interested in the house as a, one of their first projects. They wanted to restore uh, this house. And here, 1967, supposedly. Uh, uh, almost to the day when the, when landmarks received a grant from the Richard King Mountain Foundation for the restoration of the house, the house collapsed. Um, the corner on the left is the doorway. The front doorway is on, on the left corner here. And 
and here the house is taken apart. The wood, the logs were all uh, taken away by uh, the restorer whose name was uh, 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 Huck, uh, Schultz, Charles Schultz. Um, he took him to uh, his place in um, a trove, I believe, or like an air, uh, and the hand cut the um, uh, logs to match the original. So this uh, fireplace and the chimneys have never been uh, dismantled. The guy who is uh, over uh, to the left of the fireplace of the chimney uh, is probably an archaeologist from Trinity Museum. They were doing a dig there uh, while the house was dismantled. And here are some of the items they found. There are 19,000 artifacts in Kennedy Museum in their warehouse on Baltimore. Nothing is on display. Uh, here in the lower left, the lower right hand corner is a doll's arm. There's a necklace, there's a belt buckle, a hat pin, uh, some buttons. And uh, here are some more buttons. There's a coin from 1807. There are a number of coins that, are, that were found there down below the house. There are pipes. A bottle, this is uh, Wagner's, uh, uh, Wagner's uh, Light Cure. Wagner's Light Cure. Patent uh, medicine uh, uh, bottle. I uh, imagine. Here's another one with a stopper still. These are found underneath the house. There is a, uh, or there was a, uh, a pit underneath the house. Uh, and probably there was a trap door. And we don't know if that was a, uh, uh, for, uh, as a cold cellar, or maybe it was a place to hide in case of Indian attacks. Uh, that's speculation. Here's some broken ceramics. None of the ceramics that were found were intact, but there are enough pieces to make a very nice display someday. And here's some more ceramics. And then here is the house being put together. What year is that? Uh, 1969. House collapsed in 67 and the restoration is 69. Did history and landmarks supervise this? Yes. The supervision consisted of uh, telephone calls back and forth between the Schultz, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the restore, the restoration guy, and Arthur Ziegler, the president of history and landmarks. There is, unfortunately, no written record of the restoration. So, we don't know what the logs are written with. Most of the wood in the house is not original. Arthur Ziegler thinks that some of the lower logs are original. The ones in the front, uh, the, the uh, left uh, hand side is the front, the uh, right hand side is the west uh, end, and uh, he thinks a couple of those logs at the bottom are original, and on the back, a couple of the logs there are original, but he's not sure. And uh, we can't find out because there is no record uh, of, the, of the house, of the, of the restoration. I tried to call the, uh, the widow, the second wife of the, um, of the uh, of Schultz. And uh, according to his daughter, they were going, they had gone through a very nasty divorce. And she, if there had been uh, a record, she would probably have thrown away all the records, every trace of, of anything that we were had. And so, <laughs> uh, it, it just unfortunate circumstances uh, concerning the uh, restoration of this house. Uh, here's a guy uh, restoring, uh, renewing, uh, replacing a cheaping uh, on the, the, the original stone, the couple stones, and they put the new lime mortar uh, over them. Uh, originally, the chinky would have been clay um, strengthened with uh, something like 
uh, horse hair, human hair, or something to strengthen that clay. It implied that they would have to uh, uh, renew that clay every year or two years. The vine mortar also would have shrunk, but uh, they would have had uh, maybe uh, five or six years of life uh, uh, out of the lime mortar. What they have now, uh, what uh, you see was pictures of, of, of the modern, you know, the old log house, that tan stuff, that ugly tan stuff, the cement mortar, the kind of stuff they use in log houses now, but not an authentic color. But in this picture, uh, volunteers chipping away at that uh, ugly tan, chinking uh, 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 for uh, a couple of decades to get rid of it. So when the restoration was finished, this is what the you know, house looked like. Uh, here's a close-up of the logs, the notches. The uh, <clears throat> a report by an architect of the house before it collapsed said it was a very well-built house. The uh, people who built it were very good craftsmen. Uh, the notches uh, um, were closely fitted. The corners were square. The, um, the ends of the, of the rafters, roof rafters, were beveled, as they are here. And so these were cut uh, to match the original. The, uh, the original beams, or what was left of them, were numbered. They got numbered so they could match them, cut them, uh, measure them, cut them exactly to, to meet um, the, 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 the new logs to beat the, uh, to match the old logs. Here's the inside. The furnishings are not original to the Beal family. Uh, they were uh, provided donated uh, by the Junior League of Pittsburgh. They either bought them or have been donated by antique dealers. The uh, light fixtures are not original. Those are um, uh, reproductions. There's also a rifle in there which is later than uh, uh, the, the uh, meals or ammo's which is a rifle of about uh, 1845 or 1850. But otherwise, the furniture and the furnishings are uh, almost all uh, about 1800. There are a few uh, reproductions that uh, were added since then. Uh, that's a wallet table, uh, very nice. There's a drawer over, uh, you can see on the left uh, center. Uh, and the crumble bed, uh, they would have uh, pushed uh, the, uh, the smaller bed uh, underneath the same room door today and then pulled out to sleep at night. And there's the double fireplace, a smaller one for heating at night, and the bigger one for cooking during the day. It's a very large fireplace, not for cooking. They may have, uh, Ambrose even might have uh, uh, did that to, uh, to uh, provide them for an addition to the house. Uh, and, uh, uh, there's a table again, and a new reproduction, a chandelier. And the uh, brown uh, stick-like object uh, at the upper uh, right is, is the rifle, hidden somewhat. Here's some table pieces, redware, really expensive in those days. Uh, there's two pieces with uh, gold uh, decoration. That uh, picture, a very nice picture, a very nicely shaped piece of redware also. And then on the uh, left are wooden uh, uh, plates, also very common. That um, black uh, pan is, uh, I mean, I'll call it posnet. It's on three feet, and tripod feet, for, uh, to uh, raise it slightly above the uh, cooking surface. And here are some of the uh, uh, fireplace uh, utensils, all uh, Raw iron, very heavy, and then those are redware jugs down at the, uh, on the hearth. And some more uh, 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 raw iron. They're, they really weigh a ton. They, uh, that, uh, uh, that kettle on the right, that must be uh, six pounds or seven pounds. 
there's a walnut uh, dresser, um, very nice dovetailed uh, joints from Philadelphia, about 1800. The uh, serrated object at the top is a uh, is a um, shaker for uh, stogies. You roll up your uh, stogies and put it uh, in those grooves. Put the two pieces together and then let them dry. Uh, there's a painted pine cupboard. I don't know if that's the original paint or not, but it may not be the original paint. Uh, there's a bed. And this is a T-shaped uh, object of me leaning up against the leg. That is for tightening the ropes of the, um, of the uh, bed frame. And there's a basket for baby uh, over on the left side. That's the upstairs. Uh, that uh, uh, on the left is uh, a quilting frame. In the back, which you can see, is a spinning wheel. Those are probably you know, wouldn't, shouldn't really be up there, but we put some stuff up there just to have something to talk about when people are visitors are up there. There's a spinning wheel in the basket, and a, that's a uh, pine box with a drawer inside, and a brass candlestick there too. Now this is a picture of a house about 1994. The, uh, the deal between uh, Pittsburgh History and Landmarks after they um, restored the house was that Landmarks would do the educational programs, Public Works Department would do the upkeep. Landmarks found it extremely difficult for Public Works to do any kind of upkeep. Although at the time, all it took was to bring a crew over from their uh, facility, which was at that time was Cassidy Home, Phipps Conservatory. And all they had to do was mow the uh, weeds down. Of course, when they did that, they would mow everything down. And there was a guy here, Max Armbruster, who in the uh, 1960s and 70s, uh, was the gardener here, planted a lot of native plants there, uh, wild roses, uh, Rosa Virginiana, Rose, Rose uh, Carolina, um, Elderberry, um, uh, uh, the uh, sugar maples, uh, choke cherries, fire cherries, sassafras, all kinds of things that were native to Western Pennsylvania. Uh, the weeds grew faster than, the, than these native plants. So this is what it looked like. Uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, we tried, we took over in 1994, the volunteers took over in 1994. Here's a view uh, looking toward the gate. So the weeds were uh, higher than the fence. And the fence is eight feet high. And the, the, the ones in the foreground are probably five or six feet high. So the volunteers cut down the weeds we pulled them by hand, actually, so we uh, could save what was um, native. And uh, it was amazing. The wild the roses bloomed, the elderberry bloomed, uh, everything bloomed. And here we are giving tours. We cleaned up the inside, uh, we arranged the furniture, and we we're giving tours, telling people about the house. That's Jane Colborn uh, over on the left, who was one of our volunteers. Uh, she is no longer doing her tour. She uh, is not uh, well enough um, um, to do it. She was really very good with kids. And then in 1996 uh, and 97, the University of Pittsburgh uh, started an archaeological dig using high school students as the, uh, as the diggers. They did uh, two digs. One test date in 1996, and another date in 1997. They did one uh, one meter by one meter square in 1997, and then the departmental funding was cut. Not, not the public department was cut. Funding was cut. They didn't find anything uh, of value uh, as the Carnegie Museum did in uh, 1969. 
But if they had gone on, they very well could, might have. Uh, they did find some little shards of ceramics and glass and things like that. Uh, those are also in, uh, in the uh, Cairo Trinity Museum. And here is a, a bunch of students who was uh, uh, sorting and uh, pressing uh, soil through the screen looking for artifacts. So here is a picture of the roof. This is the, uh, in 2000. It's much worse now. There are much more uh, shingles uh, curled, blown up the uh, roof. Uh, there are uh, probably a quarter of the shingles gone. And I don't have any other slides I can show you. Uh, this is the only picture I have a recent uh, commission of the house. So this is the house looking at the uh, east side and the front side. And, uh, in the autumn, uh, those are uh, sassafras, these red, reddish, uh, orangish uh, leaves or sassafras trees in the back. So, what is to, to come, become of the Neil Log House? Um, the Pittsburgh Department of Service is charged with uh, the care of the park. They do know the importance of the house as an historic object in the city of Pittsburgh, but it all comes down to money. Um, they have to raise the money to restore the house. They have to raise the money to develop an educational program for the house. They have to raise money to maybe enhance the property, maybe to, uh, to uh, convert it into a, uh, a nice house museum of early Pittsburgh. And this house is in the center of the city. It's accessible. It's in the original, it's original site. It could be a great educational facility to teach, say, a bustling of school kids how people live in uh, early Pittsburgh. Uh, don't hold your breath waiting for that thing. It takes the money. About uh, four years ago, I think, three or four years ago, but, um, um, the Conservancy did try to raise money to, uh, to, to just stabilize the house to get a new roof in, to, uh, to close up the animal holes uh, around the uh, house, to close up the holes in the foundation, to, um, to repair the walk so it would be safe to walk on, to repair the door jam and so forth. Uh, all of it cost them was $40,000. They could find no one, no individual, no organization to give that money to the um, uh, to conservancy for the restoration of the house. And just the stabilization of the house, not to enhance it in any way uh, that other than as you see it now. Uh, it's ironic that uh, Pittsburgh History of Landmarks Foundation has washed their hands out of the house. They, um, because the city uh, uh, seems to have no interest in the house, Landmarks will have nothing to do with the house. And also, on the board of trustees of Landmarks, I believe uh, there are several members who uh, don't like anything to do with a house that does not have most of its original material. What is ironic is that, uh, well, Arthur Ziegler actually sent me a letter saying, to that effect that because the uh, the uh, uh, Neil Law House does not have most of this original material, Landmarks is no longer interested in the house. I think that is because of certain members of the Board of Trustees who don't like uh, houses that don't have original material. What's ironic is that the Pittsburgh History Landmarks Foundation is the organization that put this house into that condition. They restored the house, removed the bad stuff, put in new stuff, and uh, so it doesn't have most of its original original material. Uh, well, that's 
a board of trustees decision like that. I think that's uh, maybe if they get a new board of trustees, um, maybe that will change. I don't know. So uh, I have um, nothing more to say. Uh, you have questions. Uh, uh, I am open to any questions that you might have. One thing that went across over here. Neil died in the late 18th century. He died in 1801. 1801. What was the progress of this becoming a Shedley, Shed, Mary Shedley's property? You know? No. Robert Neil died uh, in 1801. We think his will is dated 1801. The will says that uh, Robert Neil uh, is gravely ill, and he signed his he signed the will with the next. So he was, probably was too ill to uh, sign the will. So he probably died soon afterwards. Uh, but uh, there are no newspaper articles saying that he died then. The will was not filed until 1804, but it was common then that legal papers would not be filed until the attorney is ready to file. And uh, so it would, it would not be unusual for Robert Neal to have died in 1801 and the will not filed until 1804. Uh, so I'm assuming that it was 1801. Uh, I can't remember the date when the property was sold, uh, but it was sold three times. The third time, James O'Hara bought the property. Uh, uh, he probably just bought it just to have, have more of Pittsburgh. Yeah. He owned, uh, he must have owned 20% uh, like of the land of Pittsburgh or a Pitt Township. You know. So he was uh, uh, a really uh, a great big land speculator. Through him and through uh, Mary Shelley's mother, Everything passed to her. Um, her mother uh, died at the age when Mary Shelley was four. So uh, she was already was probably the wealthiest child, uh, maybe in the country. Uh, she didn't have use of the, of, the, uh, of the money, of course, until she reached her majority. Uh, and it's interesting that. Um, Mary Shinley, at the age of 14, uh, was sent to uh, boarding school in uh, Staten Island, New York, by her father, uh, William Cron, who was an attorney here in Pittsburgh, came from Kentucky, came to Pittsburgh, already very wealthy and came, became even more wealthy because of his connections with uh, George Cron. He inherited a lot of land. George Cron was, was an Indian. Uh, uh, go between, but go between the Indians and the British, and also uh, trader, uh, land speculator. Um, so, uh, Mary Shinley went to, uh, was sent to New York, Staten Island, to a finishing school, the, uh, the uh, most prestigious finishing school in the country. Uh, the uh, headmistress's, headmistress's uh, brother, uh, was visiting. He was Edward Shinley. He was 43. She was 14. Uh, Mary Shinley was 14. He fell in love. He loved. They had already um, announced their uh, desire to, uh, to get married a year before, uh, but uh, of course it wasn't allowed, so they eloped. She was 14. He was 43. Uh, they caused an international scandal. They uh, got on a boat, went somewhere nobody knows, probably to Bermuda on their honeymoon. Uh, they were missing. Uh, the, the, uh, the father uh, called the federal government to look for her. Uh, uh, couldn't find them. They turned up to um, London. Queen Victoria wouldn't receive them because of the scandal. But uh, apparently they were actually more in love they were married until uh, Edward Shinley died. They had nine children. Six of them lived 
uh, to uh, adulthood. Three died in infancy. Mary Shelley didn't come back to Pittsburgh uh, very much, only twice. In uh, uh, 1889, Mary Shenley owned a good bit of Pittsburgh. She didn't sell a lot of her property. She did sell some. Uh, but the Shenley Park property was intact. Uh, Edward Bigelow wanted the property as a park because of the success of, of Central Park. Uh, in 1850, Central Park was formed uh, by Calvert Vox and uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. Uh, it was a great success. Uh, they uh, completely changed the landscape of, of Central Park. They had no hesitation of bringing in uh, uh, dynamite and just blasting away hillsides and uh, trees and uh, digging out lakes and uh, reshaping the landscape. That was what was done at Shinley Park. Edward Bigelow and the uh, a landscaper that he hired William Falconer from Scotland. They were devotees, followers of Edward Law, Olmsted Sr., and Calvert Vox. Uh, they completely changed uh, the landscape of Shenley Park. Probably the only thing that is close to uh, natural uh, before um, it became a park is Panther Hollow. Um, the deep down, deep down uh, part of, Shillick, of of Panther Hollow, uh, the upper portions of Panther Hollow, that could have been uh, completely changed, especially near the roads. Um, uh, Edward uh, Bigelow, oh, I, I'm skipping the part about uh, uh, the park formation. Highland Park also was 1889, uh, a couple of months before Shenley. Shenley was uh, November of 1889. Um, Robert Carnahan was sent by Robert by Eric Bigelow to um, London to get to successfully have uh, uh, Mary Shenley donate the uh, donate 300 acres of her property to uh, the city for the park. She sold another uh, hundred. Uh, uh, hundred and some acres to the city for, uh, I believe, uh, $75,000, something like that. The uh, part south of the, of, uh, uh, of what would be, uh, say, uh, Panther Hall Drive. And then she also sold Shumley Plaza to the city uh, for educational purposes. The park, uh, she stipulated in, uh, in the um, transfer papers that the park would be free uh, use to the public in perpetuity. Of course, now we pay for skating, we pay for this, and we pay for that in the park. So uh, no one has ever challenged that in court that I know of. Although I have heard of some, some people who said they would, would do it, but I have never heard of anybody challenging that. That would be interesting to see if that uh, uh, if that would uh, be up if her uh, uh, treaty her uh, deed would be uh, upheld in court. Uh, so, uh, what was your question? Oh, something to do with uh, James O'Hara and uh, Mary Shelley. Uh, Edward Bigelow uh, put in the road system, that was the first thing he did, put in the road system without uh, putting in any uh, facilities. Uh, the first thing he put in was, first facility he put in was uh, Phipps. It was 1893. And then uh, Canadian Museum, 1895, the library, 1895. And other things followed that. Uh, the roads um, were, uh, uh, broad and winding. Panther Hollow Drive was not uh, uh, done uh, during his time. That was in the 1930s. But um, as you come over the bridge from uh, Oakland, uh, you would turn to the right 
down Overlook Drive and wind your way uh, down around to where the Greenfield Bridge is now, then wind your way up to where the stoplight is. Um, uh, there was a carousel at that stoplight. There was a carousel in, in, in the first zoo in Pittsburgh was there. And the stables was there also. And then you would wind your way around Circuit Drive and uh, Serpentine Drive and uh, 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 work your way back to St. Shumley Plaza. Uh, Beachwood Boulevard was installed to uh, make a scenic drive through the city from uh, Shumley Park going up into East Liberty, Washington Boulevard, uh, into Highland Park. And Highland Park, uh, uh, we have Highland Avenue going uh, down to Grant Boulevard, which is now Bigelow Boulevard, named for Edward Bigelow. You, you go back downtown, uh, and you have this securitist drive to make a beautiful, the city beautiful. It was planned by Edward Bigelow. Uh, Bigelow was, a, uh, was the grandfather of the city park system. And he also planned uh, Shadyside, um, the East End. Uh, he had the really far-reaching ideas. He was hampered by uh, the fact that he was a cousin of, uh, of uh, Charles, um, uh, I'm having a block on uh, McGee, the you know, McGee Hospital guy, who uh, was a big politician there. He owned Pittsburgh Railways. He, uh, uh, and construction companies, William Flynn, William Flynn Highway. He, the two of them were uh, in the construction business and ruled Pittsburgh politics. Edward Bigelow was his cousin. And uh, when McGee died, Edward Bigelow uh, uh, decided that he would uh, uh, open public uh, contracts to open bidding. Uh, so Edward Bigelow was actually a good guy. He was uh, he was uh, uh, considered. Uh, was he the mayor? No, he was head of public works. Okay. Let's get two or three questions, and then we can break informally. What's the uh, difference between restoration and rebuilding? Uh, restoration is to uh, take the structure back to its original as best you can. Maybe not original materials but uh, maybe fake materials that look like original materials. So it's really for a rep? It could be. It depends on uh, uh, what's available. If you have the original materials available, but you, you can use them. According to the, the thing, the house collapsed. Yes, but uh, what uh, wood was reusable was reused, but there was not a lot. The lintel above the fireplace is the original log. That looked like the only thing that was standing was the fireplace. It was. The, all the wood was taken down. And then what uh, wood was reusable was put back. But most of it was replaced. So that is why that uh, there are certain people in the uh, restoration, restoration, restoration uh, preservation uh, uh, fascists who don't like anything but a house that is a structure that is totally original. One comment on that. There is no firm definition that's adopted by different groups. So you can have what Dwight talked mm -hmm. about. You can have one attitude mm -hmm. 10 years ago and another one mm -hmm. now within the same movement. Mm -hmm. the because views don't change. Mm -hmm. Our materials that were used to rebuild in 1969 and thereabouts don't change. They either were or they weren't. Yeah. And it sounds like most of them well, were all, most well, all of them were not. There is a lot of the original there. Um, there are all the all the stonework is original. The chimneys, the the, uh, the chimney, the, the two fireplaces, and the foundation, uh, and, the, and the stones and the chicken are original. They are still there. The, what is not original is most of the wood. Of course, uh, people would think of that as the that is as the most important part of the structure. So, but that's still. The house, uh, whether it has all the original wood or not, would be a great educational facility. Well, it may you know. be. That may be. But it should also be um, accurately portrayed. At the beginning, mm -hmm. I thought you said it's the second oldest house in Pittsburgh. Well, there are people who do say that there is enough there to call it a restoration rather than, say, as in Williamsburg, which is a rebuilding. Yeah. 
Uh, actually, in Williamsburg they call it reconstruction. Yeah, that's the word they use. This is an unending discussion. It's an unending discussion in the field. Any other? Yeah. How much, did, how much did it cost to restore that? Do you have any idea? Uh, the Richard King Mellon Foundation gave uh, uh, oh, between $40,000 and $50,000, but it was closer to $50,000 in 1967. Most of that money was uh, went to the restoration of the house, to the, to the rebuilding uh, and uh, the wood materials and the, and the labor. There was also plans to do uh, gardens and uh, some sheds and things like that to make it look like a real homestead. There was not enough money to, to do that. All the money practically went to the house itself. What, what happened to the uh, all the furnishings and all that were in the house? Oh, they were long gone. The original furnishings were long gone. There was nothing left of the original family except for Robert Neal's will, which is still in existence, uh, in some pieces uh, down in the register of Will's office. Uh, but the furnishings uh, in the house uh, were dispersed uh, by Robert Neal's will. It's getting late. I want to thank everyone for coming. See some of you next week in Holy Redeemer for the walk. If anyone decides this week that they'd like to do the walking tour, you might call but my numbers on the sheet on the walking tour and check if we still have spaces. We're likely to still have spaces. Early this week, if you want to come, send some money in. If you decide two or three days before, call me and we may well be able to have you pay there. That's at 6.30 next Thursday, next Tuesday night, Holy Redeemer, for a walk around the Beacon area, Beacon Street area. Uh, our next meeting, June 13th, please come, but come on Wednesday. On Tuesday, you'll find a locked door. Dwight, thank you very, very much for a very